Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm doing a testing here. Yep, mic works. Welcome to lecture four. Uh, before we get started today, uh, I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, you have been so gracious to us to have condescended to come down and not only show us what you're like, but to give us a bounty of information for which we can look through and come to a better understanding of you, what went wrong, and the great price you had to pay to get things back. We ask that you will send the Holy Spirit to be with us this morning as we contemplate these uh, monumentous um, activities on your part. May, our, may we be open to uh, your influence, to his influence, is our prayer. In thy name, amen. Now, as I've been saying, and I'll just say it again for everyone, the first two lectures are on YouTube, and I have given Dr. Small, he's going to be the clearinghouse, if you don't mind. You can contact him, and it'll be very easy for you to access. This one today uh, is appearing to be... Um, it's appearing to be recorded, so this one will be uploaded today if everything goes correctly, and it will be on YouTube sometime next week. Our bugaboo is last week's, which um, the audio did not get captured. And so uh, I was just talking with Dr. Small. He has he did record the audio last week, and we do have all this, the, the uh, integrity, which is this... Um, uh, the program that we're using for the capturing these lectures did capture all the slides. So we're going to see if we can marry the two, and then that can be put up, and then we'll be all up to date. So I'll keep you in, informed on that. All right, today we're going to look at um, another look at sin, part two, the biome. Now, just as um, uh, for, for review purposes, if you remember last week, we ended the lecture, and I gave you a definition for sin for the first time. And last week, uh, if you recall, when it says, or adding to the code, it had a further three or four words that says, which will lead to addiction. Well, when we're dealing with human beings, and, re and the way that our brains have been um, altered by these mobile genetic elements, if you continue to use the circuitry, which are under control of those mobile genetic elements, which last time I gave you the assumption that since all of the things these mobile gene genetic elements do fit right in with the Bible's description of sin, that we're going to say the devil was the author of them, that if you use them, they increase the number in those neurons and it gets to the place where you will become addicted to that behavior. We're now going to be talking about plants and animals. And even though we're going to use the word addiction, it's going to be different than it is for you and I. So I have taken that off so that it's not confusing because someone will say, well, how do plants get addicted? Well, if you really dig down, they do. But the, the, the circuitry and the way things are set up with information theory, they do. But most people don't. It is not intuitive to them, so let's just leave that off. I don't want it to be confusing. Now, also on the line of review, remember we talked about aging and death, the, the first death. Uh, we haven't talked about the second death. We won't do that until lecture 10. The Bible makes it very clear. There's two types of death. There's death type one, or the first death, which is often referred to as a sleep and people we know have been resurrected from that, Lazarus, um, the widow's, um, son, uh, widow of Nain's son. There's a number of resurrections from that type of death which we've experienced, and which we will all experience, with the except, and all of us that have come, all human beings who have lived on the earth have experienced it with the exception of Enoch and Elijah, at least that, that I know of. So this is the, the first death that we were talking about last week. And just as a reminder, it's, it's a program into the cell. The 1.5% uh, approximately of protein coding areas in our genome that appear to be relatively free of mobile genetic element uh, infestation, uh, it turns out that they're really not totally free. Because if, 
when you do a study called proteinomics, that's where you go in and you look at what proteins are actually finally made by transcribing those protein coding areas in the DNA and actually looking at the proteins, you'll find that they're all, without exception, slightly defective. And what do I mean by slightly defective? Well, they're not efficient in what they do. The jobs that they've been coded to do, they can't do as well as they should. And consequently, what happens because of that is the cell builds up with what we call cellular debris. It's metabolites that haven't fully been um, worked on or that are or products which are defective. And if the products are defective, they can't go on in the cell system of metabolic programming. And what ends up happening is that these molecules build up in the cell to the point where they start to choke the cell. And remember, we call that senescence when the cell says, whoa, we can't do any more. We can't divide anymore. We, if we're a liver cell, we can't detoxify foreign substances in the blood. We can't regulate glucose with glycogen storage. We're done. If this is a life and death matter. We have to stop right where we are because the cell is in danger of expiring. Remember we went to that point? And then we went on to discuss the fact that when it gets into senescence, two things happen. First of all, the maintenance crew that keeps all of the mobile genetic elements locked up. Remember the heterochromatin that we talked about in lecture number two? Remember that? The cell lock, locks up whole uh, lines of the DNA because they're so infested with mobile genetic elements that they threaten the cell's existence. Well, if you want to look at it this way, those mobile genetic elements are in prison in the cell. And what happens is the cell can't afford to keep the prison system functioning, and so the inmates start getting out. And when they start getting out, they start creating havoc. And when they start creating havoc, the cell, um, in this analogy, starts calling out the entire police force that has left and says, go out and just start locking people up. And what happens with the police force when it goes out to start locking up, guess what it locks up? It lets the criminals go, and it starts locking up the good stuff. It, it starts locking up the good citizens, the protein coding areas of the cell, which are required to code for proteins, which are necessary for the cell to survive. So two things happen. You get hypomethylation, which is lockdown of the mobile genetic elements, and you get hypermethylation, which is a lockdown of the good, uh, when I say good, of the, of the protein coding areas that are essential to the cell. So you can see this is a recipe for disaster. And at that point, the cell has two pathways it can go on. It can go on to develop cancer, or it undergoes apoptosis, which is a designed self-degradation mode that the cell goes into where it chops up every part of the cell and, and send, packages it up, sends it up to the neighbors so they can use it, turns off the lights, we're done. That is coded into all of us. Even if we could avoid any mechanical injury or any infectious agents, this will get us, all of us. It is, I hate to say it, but it's true, it's a death sentence for everyone in this room. But we've, because we've grown up with it, we, we've grown up to think it's okay, it's normal. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15, that death is the last enemy? to be overcome. Death is an enemy, folks. And the papers I showed you last neat week show that if you could get rid of this metabolic inefficiency problem, there's no reason why a cell couldn't live forever. There is no reason. The only reason that cell doesn't live forever is because of mobile genetic elements. Okay, and that's the first death. Now, the second thing we covered last week, and we spent a lot of time on it, because the first part of the lecture we talked about disease, and we, we did spend a little bit of time on diseases of the brain, like psychosis, manic depression, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, those things, those are all tied hand in hand with mobile genetic elements. If you didn't have mobile genetic elements, you wouldn't have those problems. But that was in the first part of the discussion, which was under disease. The second part of the lecture was probably even more important because that affects those of us, and I'm going to include myself in that number, that consider ourselves normal, and I put quotes around that. We're functioning human beings. We're here today. We can, you know, we are able to interact with each other. 
But we've, does it mean the disease process is, isn't there? And in fact, isn't it true that if the disease is hidden from you, it's actually a lot worse than if you know about it? And did you see the way that the neurons have been taken over by these mobile genetic elements? I talked about methylation and, and um, the uh, fact that each one of the neurons is different from the other as far as the genetic makeup. You can go into the to the brain and you would think all of those brain cells have the same code, they're in lockstep, they're all working from the same page of the songbook and nothing could be further from the truth. They're actually different genomes in your brain. You have one that's a preponderance which codes for you, but if you go from one neuron to the next, that's called mosaicism, you'll find one that you will find that the genome is different between the two and it's being used differently and the reason is is because mobile genetic elements, once they get into the cell, they take a life of their own and they change that cell uniquely. So stop and think for a moment because we're going to have to go in a couple weeks and say, what is God going to do about this problem? You have approximately, and I have approximately 120 trillion cells in our body but let's just make it easy for God. Let's say he only has to work about with the neurons that we have in our mind, which are easily around 100 billion, probably more. But let's be conservative. Let's say 100 billion. For him to clean up this mess, he has 100 billion problems with you and with me. Now, if you compare me with you, the problems, the differences are much greater. So now the plan of salvation isn't just about cleaning me up and I've got 120, well, I've got 100 billion problems. Let's say the rest of them just don't, aren't in the equation. He now has, well, how many billion people on this earth do you think are calling upon God's name at this point in time? Potentially two, three, four billion, I don't know. Let's, let's be conservative. So let's say three and a half, half of them are. Now multiply that times 100 billion. Quite a bit of work there, wouldn't you say? That's why the statement is made that if there was just one person on this earth, God would have to devise, would have come down and would have made a plan of salvation for them. Because at this point, when you're working with 100 billion problems in one individual, what's adding another three and a half billion? That's just rounding up. The salvation that was acquired for you and me is mind-boggling in its complexity. And yet how often do we take it with a grain of salt? Just assume it's there. The other thing I want to bring to your mind is we're because I want to keep this fresh in your thinking as we go along because I have to I want to do this for a number of reasons but one is when we get to salvation issues I don't want to have to go through the problems again I want the, the general idea of the problems to be available for you so we can just jump into the solutions at least the solutions we know about do you remember the fact that the neurons not only do they have a completely different genetic makeup due to the mobile genetic elements, but they also have different numbers of chromosomes. 64% of the neurons in our brains do not have 46 chromosomes. They have 45 or 47. And as I pointed out last time, that, that is caused, and remember I showed you the paper. You can, when we get this up on the YouTube, you go back last week because I shot a lot of information. It was kind of like... Uh, I had an AK-47 of information and I was trying desperately to get through the entire topic. Go back and look at that because that's caused by, caused by mobile genetic elements. That's called aneuploidy or aneuploid. Euploid is 46, aneuploid is 45 or a number other than 46. And I'll, I forgot to give you an illustration of uh, aneuploidy, and that's trisomy 21, Down syndrome, you've heard of that? You have three, well, you have two 21, number 21 chromosomes, and you have a certain 
percentage of the third one. And the more you have of the third one, the more likely, for instance, the poor affected individual is going to have cognitive decline issues or cognitive dysfunction issues. So more is not better here. It's like um, trying to write a book and having chapter five in that book and having someone write over the chapter three times and all the letters are on the page. And you've got to try to decipher what's, what they're trying to say. When you change the number of chromosomes in a cell, that's a big deal. It's a big deal. And 46% of your neurons and my neurons have that problem. And don't forget, 80% of the mobile genetic elements, where do they nest? Right next to protein coding areas that supply transcription for the central nervous system. That's not by accident. Remember, go back, and they, when we get it up on the YouTube, go back last week and, and look at the the, the bar graphs I showed you of what happens as uh, in the brain and the number of transpose on uh, jumping back and forth and all of that stuff. Just uh, avail yourself of it. These are general concepts. You don't have to learn all the names. But get an, I want you to get a gestalt idea of what we're dealing with here. And the first five lectures are to try to drill home that this is a mammoth problem. And I hope you'll get to the realization you wonder why, how in the world are we still here? And how are we still functioning? Now I use the word biome here and I've used it actually incorrectly. If you want to go and look up the definition, I brought it here for you, you'll see that um, what I was inferring at the beginning is that I was referring to the earth as the biome and that I am readily acknowledging that I have enlarge the scope of the definition of this word. Biome usually, is, for instance, if you go to rainforest or you go to the high desert or you go to the tundra, what the scientists say is that's a biome and they look at all the animals and all of the plant life and how they all interact with the environment and the climate. And I'm going to take the liberty since I can make my own definitions if I choose, it's my lecture, uh, I'm going to tell you that I want to make the biome the whole world. Let's just look at the whole world. Let's not cut it up into the different zones and the different types of environments, which surely can be done, but I'm saying I'm going to generalize. I'm going to talk about everything else but you and me. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestations of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity. Now, the underlining and the parentheses are mine. I should, I have to tell you that each lecture I, uh, to make sure that no one uh, thinks, goes to their Bible and looks this up and says, boy, my Bible doesn't say that. It says, for the creature was made subject to vanity. Now, the, the Greek word from the Thayer um, uh, dictionary is perverseness, depravity, and fragility, which I think all three apply, you're going to see today. I'm going to make the point that those, that's exactly what, what, what the mobile genetic elements have done to our environment. They've made it perverse, they've depraved it, and it is very fragile. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And not only they, but we ourselves, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Um, have you ever stopped and looked at what the wild animals have to do to survive. I still have a home in Montana. And I have, uh, I can tell you it gets cold in Montana. If you think it gets cold here, come visit. February would be a good month. It gets um, minus 20 and it can stay there for two weeks. And they have cattle there. Those cattle, most of the cattle are left out on the range. When you drive by, you'll see they're all huddled together in this, 
the steam is coming up from their bodies and from their and they have cattle they change and have certain ones stand on the outside because it's cold and then everyone on the inside gets the body warmth from the cattle around it and then they exchange and they there's no movement they're they're trying to keep energy expenditure to a minimum so they can survive this winter and the same is for buffalo by the way and that's why you're in uh, if they catch you chasing a buffalo uh, if you go down to um, Yellowstone uh, they'll find you kick you out of the park those if you chase them that can be just enough to be the difference between them and life and death what about the animals that are uh, under predation that you know uh, um, a bunny rabbit that goes out to eat some grass and is a little less diligent than it should and then a cock picks it up or an eagle. Every minute of every day, these animals are subject to death right around the corner. And they live their entire life with that front and center. Now, would you think that's a good way to exist? And the bad part was they had nothing to do in this whole thing. They were brought along, as Paul points out. They didn't have, they didn't do anything to be here. We've done it to them. And if you want to really see what we've done to them, go down to an animal shelter, one that takes in abused animals. See what we have, we, they already have a tough road to hoe, and guess what we've done? We've made it much worse. And before we say, oh, well, yeah, that's too bad about the animals, let me point out two other things to you. The first thing is, is that human beings get, you know, we don't have predation, but we have something else. We have war. You've heard of post-traumatic stress syndrome? Well, we have our equivalent. And let's take it a step further. I was reading an interesting article by a psychiatrist. It was written about three months ago. It was published in the New York Times. And he was talking about the fact that he had just returned from his stepfather's funeral. His, his mother had been married, it turns out, twice. And the second husband had just died. And he had been back with her, his mother for the funeral. And as they were talking afterwards, um, he brought, she brought up the fact that um, she had was still mourning for her first husband who had died when she was 23. And she said, I never brought it up to you because I thought, what's my problem? But she says, I've never been able to shake it. And she goes, now I'm mourning for two husbands. And he went on to say in this paper, he goes, you know, and they talked about post-traumatic stress syndrome, and he says, but the rest of us, the ones who aren't suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome, we're suffering from pre-traumatic stress syndrome because we look around and we see all of the stress and the terrible things that are happening to people around us, and we realize, but for the grace of God, there go I. And so we spend all of our, well, a, a good portion of our time trying to make sure we avoid the trauma that's out there, which it eventually will get to us all. I know you're thinking, what's this guy trying to do? Depress us here this, this morning? I'm not. I'm just trying to say, let's look at things. And nor is the take home message, I want you to go home and become morose. Because we all try to put the best possible face on, which we should, in order to continue to function. But at the same time, we need to look at the fact that under the best of conditions, this existence really ain't that good. We have a better country where all of this goes away. And I don't care if everything is going perfect for you right now. In the back of your mind, just like in the computer, which has a program running, and if you know if you get too many programs running, if you don't have enough RAM, the computer slows down, well, this, com this program is running in the back of all of our minds, this pre-traumatic stress syndrome issue. So none of us are immune. Now, we're going to take a whirlwind view of going through the, uh, my definition of the biome. Let's go with air first. I'm sure that if I were to pick one thing 
that you probably would say there isn't any mobile genetic influence in, it would be air, wouldn't you? Well, I mean, I should have, I should have not have put this slide up. I should have asked everyone first. But I'm, I'm a man on a mission today. I got to get through on time. So some of these um, fun niceties are going to be sacrificed. No. Every cubic millimeter of air has between 1.7 million viruses to 4 40 million viruses in it. If, when you come to the fall and winter, here's a cheery note, you go up to the 40 million. Why? People are sick. And also humidity and all the and, and other varying conditions in the environment uh, allow more of these viruses to become airborne. Spring is actually, surprisingly, the lowest time with, with the viral count in the air. We are walking and living in a sea of viruses, folks. I hate to break it to you. And remember, viruses are in the mobile genetic element family. They're one of the first offshoots. We had lines and signs and ALUs and SVUs and all those different great things. Well, viruses are one of that. They're right in there with the rest. So take a deep breath in and be aware of what you're breathing. Luckily, not all of these viruses are keyed to go after, are, and they are. They're programmed. They're not programmed to go after humans, human cells. There are many of these viruses are, are from plants, animals, and other, and, and as we're going to see here in a second, from um, marine life and things of that nature. That's what they're keyed for. Segwayed right into the ocean. Okay, viruses are by far the most abundant life forms, and they put that in quotes. You know, we've gone back and forth. Some of the uh, journal articles I put up here call them a form of life, and others say, no, they're not. I'm of the second opinion because viruses have no existence outside of a cell that they can commandeer and take over. All they are is a control center. They don't have any of the other machinery, and until they can take over another cell machinery, they really don't have much of a life. So they, they have no life at all. They just lay around and wait until they get an opportunity to come in and take over. There is estimated 10 to the 30 viruses in the ocean. If stretched end to end, that would span further than the nearest 60 galaxies. Now let's put this in perspective. The closest galaxy is Andromeda, which is 2 million light years away. Galaxies are usually at least 2 million light years apart, although you do have some galaxy clusters. But let's just be conservative and let's say that there's a galaxy every 2 million light years stretched right out there and there's 60 of them. We're looking at a, basically at least 120 light years out there. That's how many ocean, uh, that's how many viruses there are in the ocean. That's a lot. And as it points out here, it's a major source of mortality. You're going to see another slide in a moment, and I'll show you just what a major source of mortality it is. If you look at the biomass, the viruses are blue. Notice there, if you look at the biomass, they're, they're very small in comparison to the total biomass available. And that's because all they are is instructions. And their instructions are instructed to make more of themselves, and they don't care who and what they damage along the way to get there and how many other cells they kill. That's their only purpose. And so it's logical that they wouldn't have the biomass because they don't have to have the machinery to carry out their devious plans. They hijack a cells machinery to do it for them. But look at, if you're going to look, remember we're talking information. Remember information theory. Don't let lecture two fade away. All that important stuff about information because that's the key. We've got to keep our eye on information. Information is going to be the key from the beginning and it's the key at the very end and it's all the key along the way. So information is what counts here, remember? Information is what really drives everything in our world. And look who wins the information war in the ocean. It's not even close. 
Who rules the ocean? Who has it under control? Mobile genetic elements. Plants and animals. Well, in, in um, plants, we have uh, the families that infect uh, animals, mammals and humans, hominids particularly, they are the Lyme-1s, the signs, the ALUs, the SVUs, the viruses. In plant life, it's different. They're called long terminal repeats. They're just variations of the same idea, but they're uh, very well engineered to take over a plant genome versus, say, a mammalian genome. Um, we, know, we show that the retroposition has current, recurrently occurred in all plant genomes, I'm quoting from them here, investigated, regardless, regardless of their size and through bursts rather than a continuous process. I wish we had time today to talk about the burst phenomenon because it has a big ramifications for us. But some of the things have to be cut off and removed for another time, and that's one of the things I have decided to do because of its complexity and the length of time. And I don't want to get this lecture to become too wonkish so that you walk out of here with just a bazillion facts but have no idea how they're connected. This is a soybean. Now, I'm plant-based. So soybeans are definitely in my almost daily existence. Now, to help you look at this slide, and I'm sorry that the colors don't jump out more, but the dark gray is the quote-unquote unmolested information or code that's in the soybean plant. The, boy, I don't know, the, the colors here are so bad. Um, the other variations of gray, I have good color on my, on my uh, monitor here, but you don't. Anything other than gray is not. It's mobile genetic element. And I, since it's hard to look at this and, and make the calculations with your eye, I'll make it for you. Soybeans is a, uh, the, the genome in the soybeans is approximately 80% mobile genetic element, 20% original. Corn, it's much worse. In fact, the animal kingdom, uh, I mean, the animal kingdom is, I mean, the plant kingdom has been really hit hard in comparison to the animal kingdom. Now stop and think for a moment, why if, this is my paradigm that I'm saying that the devil's behind mobile genetic elements, and I've given you a lot of illustrations from what they do. And if you look to the Bible, which is our only authority to define what sin is and, and who the devil is, so science isn't going to do it for us. It fits in perfectly with the, what the Bible says. Why would the devil go after plants? Well, what was the original diet of everything? of all living things. Now, we don't have time today, uh, and nor in, at any subsequent time in the lectures, although Dr. Webster will be uh, broaching on it. What you eat is vitally important in this whole war, because that's what it is. Food is nothing more than information that you put into your mouth. And that information is going to go in and it's going to affect your genome. And even though you eat that hot fudge sundae and you enjoy it, and you, as that sundae goes down into your stomach, you sit there and you think, okay, don't. Just go right through the other end of the tube. Don't do anything else. Just go right through. It isn't going to happen. It's going to, be go it's going to go in and it's going to go into your cells. And it's going to do all kinds of things, none of which are good. But the one thing I am going to deviate here, it wasn't scripted, but I'm going, I'm going to go for it, is that the, what you eat affects the methyl, methylation in your cell. And the methylation primarily of the mobile genetic elements, what you eat can affect how efficacious your cell is in methylating these mobile genetic elements. And I'm going to make it real simple for you. If it's not plant-based, it's working against you, big time. End of my little missive.
We're going to be looking at some animals here in a moment. If you wanted to look at what it's done to cattle and what it's done to, um, to swine and to fowl and everything, the mobile genetic elements have gone in there and they've clearly had their way. But I want to point something out that needs to be clarified here. When you look at any of the mammals, for instance, compared to us, you will see that we have about three and a half times more genetic, more mobile genetic element per capita. And by, by per capita, I mean per nucleotide, per the total number of nucleotide versus the, the other, as you go down the mammal chain. For instance, you go to chimpanzees, they have the second highest amount of mobile genetic elements. You get down to a mouse, it has three and a half times less than we do. Chimpanzees have fairly close to what we do. And that's been used by the evolutionists as an example of, well, we all evolved from apes. Dr. Webster is going to be talking, I think it's in two weeks, he's going to be addressing that issue. So if you're, if you're going to come to that conclusion, it's based on some, what we feel is fallacious reasoning, and he'll be giving you a better insight into it. Now, this uh, paper is very interesting because it goes into poisonous snakes. Have you ever wondered why we have animals that carry a venom which, when injected into another animal, causes severe impairment and or death? Where'd that come from? It's very clear when we look at Isaiah um, 11 and Isaiah 65 and 66, where God says, there's nothing harmful on my holy mountain. And Revelation 21 forces, there will be no death there. So clearly, God did not Im embed a ability to have a poisonous substance that one animal could inject into another. This is foreign. So guess, well, what did, what did they, um, uh, where should we go to find out whether, whether or not it is? The logical thing would be to look at mobile genetic elements. They've been coming up and they've been doing quite well, thank you, when we've been looking for the causes of um, what the Bible causes sin. So. Wouldn't that be one of our first places to look? And we will here in a moment. Now, there's two things on this paper that are important. The first one is the one I've got up here. It says that the, don't get tied up in the words. I'm going to reinterpret this and put it into English. The, the polygenetic analysis of E. oscillatus um, in the signs, that stands for short interspersed nucleotide elements. Those are mobile genetic elements. It's a family. Indicate that their origin correlates with the time frame of the evolution of snake venom system. What they're saying here is that some signs, those are mobile genetic elements, short interspersed nucleotide elements, infested the snake at some time in the past, and they caused something called um, copy number variation. Now, what's copy number variation? That's where you take a gene and you copy it a number of times. And sometimes you flip them around and turn them backwards, but you get a number of these genes lined up. That's very bad for the cell. It's a, it's a cause of numerous diseases. If we'd have had time last week and I could have talked more about the, uh, the, the disease issue, it is, it is a cause of num numerous human diseases. But what it did in the snake was it says existing snake venom toxins are the result of recruitment events by which ordinary genes were duplicated, that's poly number uh, variation, by events um, and that the new genes selectively expressed in the venom gland, notice that, this copy number variation occurred in the cells in a snake's venom gland. So it doesn't occur elsewhere in the snake almost looks like someone planned this, you know, if you stop and think about it, it almost looks like it's engineered. Uh, and um, expressed in the venom gland and amplified to multi-gene families with extensive neo-functionalization just means it's got a new 
this the new protein that came from all of these copy number variation genes lined up was snake venom. What causes copy number vari uh, um, variation? Mobile genetic elements. They're the only thing that do it. There's no other way we know right now in our biome whereby this could have happened. It has to be mobile genetic elements. Copy number variation is one thing, is a number of the things they do, and only they do them. Now, the other thing about this paper, which we won't go into, but is very fascinating, and that is, is that the prey of these rattlesnakes determines, it's, it's very well engineered so that the prey that they are killing determines what type of venom they make. When the snakes are younger, they use a neurotoxic venom, which paralyzes their prey. The snakes are smaller, and they have to uh, take longer time to get the prey, kill it, and swallow it. As the snake gets bigger, it goes to a to one that um, causes uh, uh, anemia. It attacks the the blood vessels. I mean the blood cells. It's a hemolytic ven venom, and that is carried. The information is carried by something called microRNAs, which are present in the prey of the snake. So as the snake gets bigger, it starts killing different animals, maybe goes from baby mice to other uh, animal forms in the, uh, animal, uh, in, the, in the area. And so the feedback from the microRNAs, which is something we haven't talked about, but we're going to talk about it big time when we get to the salvation. I'm just throwing this out so you get used to hearing new terms. The microRNAs, or in, as far as you're concerned, small little genetic elements that are found in the food that they eat, come into the snake and feed back and actually affect the, the snake's uh, DNA or geno uh, coding in the, uh, where it makes the venom and changes it. Are you getting an idea how we are not silos out here walking around in this environment? We are actively influenced by our environment and we influence our environment. It's a two-way street. And I know you're going to say quit beating that drum, but you, what you and I eat, there's microRNAs in all the food we eat. And it plays back on us just like it does on the snake. And in the snake, it's actually able to change the type, the way the venom works. And I probably don't need to go into the fact that if you're eating animal-based food, you're getting the wrong feedback. And if you're eating plant-based food, you're getting the right feedback. Dr. Webster is going to shoot me because I'm taking his lecture. I'm taking stealing his thunder. OK, why am I looking at bacteria separately? If you look at just life forms on this earth and you exclude viruses, because I don't call them the life form, bacteria went out without a doubt. And they are vitally necessary for our survival. If you look at your um, the, the bacteria that you have covering your skin and is present in your GI tract, you couldn't really live very well without them. The bacteria in your GI tract are like middlemen. What they do is they take the food and they process it and they make it so that it's very easy for the microvilli in your small intestine to pick up the nutrients. So the middleman decides what is going to be presented to the microvilli. And I'm sure you've heard a lot of, and read a lot about, uh, it's been in the, in the press, where if you um, take bacteria which are found in people who are morbidly obese, and you take those strains and you implant them into someone who is not morbidly obese, they gain weight. The second group gains weight. And you keep the diets the same. Because the bacteria are responsible for not only presenting what type of nutrients are presented, but the amount of, for instance, the calories that are presented. So if you have the right probiota, which is the name for all the bacteria in your gut, it will, 
if you're on a plant-based diet and you've been on it for, say, six months or more, so you've got your probiota changed over because the bio probiota in an omnivore versus a plant-based is markedly different. And it's also different from an ovo-lacto-vegetarian. And as you move to plant-based, you get a better and better and better probiota, one that's very friendly for you. That the, if, you, if you look at the probiota from an omnivore and you look to versus a person who's a plant-based person, you will find that the plant-based bacteria pre present 25% fewer calories for absorption for any given meal that could be given to both parties. So if you're plant-based, you can eat 25% more calories, and they're free. And I could go on about the fact that the probiota in your, in your GI tract is very important because they put out things called pseudoneurotransmitters and neurotransmitters. What are neurotransmitters? Well, they're, we're going to get to those if I can get moving here. They're what makes your brain tick. They're the connections between all the neurons, between the axons and the dendrites. The, the, they have actually done a number of studies, and believe it or not, this is in the psychiatric literature, where they have treated patients with manic uh, depressive disorder, bipolar, and they've found that treating them with plant-based diet versus tricyclic antidepressants or SSRIs, that Statistically, they're the same, but if you look at the data, actually the plant-based people do a little bit better as far as dealing with the, the, um, with the disease. Bacteria are important for us to have our immune systems working correctly, and that's why they say now that too, too many children are kept in an aseptic environment, and that's why we have such an increase in asthma, because what happens is the body doesn't get used to the normal bacterial flora that, that is surrounding most people, and, what ha and then when these children are exposed and they go out and leave the home, and they're exposed to these what we would consider non-pathogenic bacteria, they get a reaction to them as if they're an antigen or a foreign um, attacking agent, and the consequence is their body puts out a lot of pro-inflammatory chemicals, and those that, uh, and when that happens in the lung, you get bronchoconstriction, which is, a, which is asthma. Obviously, I could go on and on about the probiota. I won't. I'm going to stop at this point, but I wanted to get across to you that these little bacteria are vitally important for all life on this earth. If there weren't bacteria here, probably wouldn't be any life. In fact, I'm going to, it's easy to say there wouldn't be because what they do to plankton in the ocean, which is the beginning of the food chain, there, there wouldn't be any life. They're little factories which are all over doing things which for us which we don't have to have coded in our bodies. There are 3.2 million genes in the different bacteria in your gut. That you, you and I carry around 21,500, give or take. That number keeps changing from month to month, but the latest number, I've given you the latest number. The vast amount of information, remember we're talking the information theory here, information either makes you win or lose, the vast amount of information in your body is carried by these little guys sitting in your gut. You should be thinking about every way you can to promote the right kinds and make their life as happy as possible because they'll make your life as happy as possible in return. This is a symbiotic relationship. Now it says, genomes from all the crucial bacteria of pathogens of humans, plants, and animals have now been sequenced, and as, as have genomes from many of the important commensal, symbiotic, and environmental organisms. Now I have just been talking to you about the latter group, the commensal, symbiotic, and environmental ones. What about the pathogenic? Well, let me get things, put things in perspective for you. Approximately 98% of the bacteria in our biome, as defined by me, are good. We need them. That's the word commensal. They are there to help us, and, 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 and hopefully we're going to be helping them. About 2% aren't. Why? By now, I'm hoping that you are catching on to the trend of this talk and the other three, and you would guess if I asked you mobile genetic elements would be the cause. They would be the culprit. And if, you th if you're thinking that, you would be right. 
It's called, they, uh, the words here, they talked about plasmids, uh, which are little rings of information that are passed between these prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are single cell organisms. They don't have a nucleus. The DNA is just right out there in the cell with everything else. Um, and that's what the second, uh, the first group is talking, the first group it puts the, uh, refers to here the crucial bacterial pathogens of humans, plants, and animals. That's the group I'm referring to. Analysis of these sequence has revealed the forces that shape pathogen evolution and has brought to light unexpected aspects of pathogen biology. The findings, here it is, if I could honk a horn, I hear I would. The findings that horizontal gene transfer, anytime you see a lot of genetic information moving quickly between uh, living organisms, think mobile genetic elements, has brought um, that the finding of horizontal gene transfer and genome decay have key roles in the evolution of bacterial pathogens was particularly surprising. It has also become evident that even the dis definitions of pathogen and virulence factor need to be reevaluated. What they're saying here is, well, it appears like all the bacteria at one time were, were well, were good. They were good actors. They were living in the environment and, and actually contributing. And that somewhere along the line, that gene decay is brought on by mobile genetic elements and plasmids are mobile genetic elements. And they're, so they're saying something came in and reprogrammed to make them become virulent and selfish in their behavior. They talk about transposable elements as genomic diseases. It is suggested, I'm quoting, that bacterial genomes infected by insertion sequences typically do not persist on long evolutionary time scales. Otherwise, the transposable elements would show greater within genome divergence. In other words, insertion sequences may be the kiss of death for a bacterial genome. Why I put this in is it's, it's not at first obvious when you read what's on the screen. What they're really saying is this. If um, mobile genetic elements had been around for a long time with the bacteria, we wouldn't have any because once they infect different bacterial lines, they usually cause them um, to greatly decrease in number or actually go extinct. So this, the infestation into the bacteria had to be relatively short. Now, relatively short for an evolutionist is a million years. Um, but I'm, I'm throwing this in as a, an idea for you to, to look at the fact that there are signs and signals out there in our environment that point to the fact that this, if you just look at mobile genetic elements, life really could not have been here that long because of what these mobile genetic elements do to the different hosts that they, that they become part of. Insertion sequences, again, when you hear that word, we're talking mobile genetic elements, are small transposable genetic elements widely distributed in bacteri bacterial genomes. They are generally very short and contain only the genetic information essential for their transposition. Now, transposition means that they can jump between one chromosome and another. In this case, in bacteria, there's just one big chromosome in a circle in the bacteria, so it can jump to different parts of that circle. The key is, is that they're smaller in bacteria because there's fewer genes that they have to worry about. But they jump in bacteria just like they jump in our genome. The MO is the same. Now, this is very interesting and I wanted to point this in because this illustrates a fact a theme that we've already introduced last week. We're going to have it this week. And uh, when we get to probably lecture six, we're going to introduce this theme again. So the more times I bring it to your attention, the easier it will be for you to uh, come to um, become comfortable with it. It says antibiotic resistance, virulence, and other plasmids um, use the toxin, antitoxin gene pairs. Now. Antibiotic resistance, those are come in by plasmids, those are mobile genetic elements. Virulence means this is what makes the bacteria a very 
bad neighbor to all of its, in its surroundings, whether it's other bacteria or if, if that bacteria lodges in you and I and begins to um, be, uh, start to be destructive. They all use the toxin antitoxin gene pairs to ensure their persistence during host replication. The toxin antitoxin system eliminates plasma free cells that emerge as a result of segregation or replication defects and contributes to inter, intra and interspecies plasmid, plasmid dissemination. What are they saying here is, well, there's a special, I call it a cassette, a little special cassette that comes in on these plasmids that give information to this bacteria to become um, destructive. Uh, Methicillin resistant Staph aureus. You've all heard of MRSA. It's it's all out there. Well, the reason that the that Staph aureus is resistant to many or most of the antibiotic antibiotics out there is because the plasmid comes in, which is a small little circle of DNA, much not much in the shape, not much different than the big one that the cell has that it works with, and they code for um, protein complexes which in essence, um, stop the antibiotic from working. Okay, there's many different ways they can do it. Let's not go into it. It just, it just counteracts what the antibiotic would do. But with this also comes other protein sequences that may allow that Staph aureus to um, let out different, different chemicals in its surroundings that help to destroy your body's defenses against it and actually break down and kill cells. And that's what makes it a bad actor because it starts killing cells around it and it picks up the nutrients from those cells and what it's really looking for is iron because bacteria have to have iron. They have, they have mitochondria like we do and, and aerobic metabolism requires iron in the cytochromes where the ATP is made. And they, they go looking for it. They, they are desperate to get iron. And that's why they'll attack you and I and they would love to sit and live in our system because we have hemoglobin. And it's loaded with iron. So that's their motivation. And um, so what happens is this plasmid will come in, or maybe a plasmid has come in in the past and now become part of the genome of this bacteria to have that information. So now it's, it's, it's equipped. It's equipped to combat the antibiotic we're going to put in to stop it. And it's equipped to do some very bad things to us if it gets lodged in our and within us in some area. But here's the catch: Suppose Staph aureus. We now we're going to talk um, teleologically here for a moment, so go with bear with me. Let's suppose we could have a uh, intervention with the uh, Staph aureus bacteria. Let's suppose for a minute they're intelligent. They're, they're intelligent in a different way, but not in the way I'm using. But Go with me because I want to. It's the point I'm trying to make. And we could talk to those bacteria and we could say, Stop your bad ways. Turn around. You're being bad actors. We can all live in this environment together. You guys are being selfish. We'll find out a way to get you iron. And in return, you give up your bad ways, turn in your weapons, and let's make a truce. You know what they tell us? No can do. Why? Because these same plasmids that came in and make these bacteria impervious to our, most of our antibiotics and have equipped them with some pretty nasty enzymes that can go out and digest around their environment and digest away their host cells, also has another, what is called, um, I think, what the toxin antitoxin system. So there is coded in that genetic information the. Um, a protein which is lethal to that bacterium. But right next to it is a protein coding area which has an antidote for it. You can think of it as being a toxin, it's toxin antitoxin, it chelates to it and it keeps it from functioning. If you get rid of the plasmid that has the information for it to be resistant to antibiotics and for it to be able to have the capability of digesting the area around it, because the Staph aureus has decided to come clean and live a good life. The toxin that is left in the cell that is bound to the antitoxin would remain. The trouble is, is the antitoxin decays before the toxin does. 
So the antitoxin, which is chelating it and keeping it locked up, melts away, leaving the toxin to kill the bacteria. Once this infects the bacteria, it has no choice. It must continue on. If it does not continue to use this um, uh, the pla information on the plasma, it dies. So when we read in Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 61 that God, Christ came to release the prisoners, in a way, he's talking about all creation, not just us. And they refer to this as an addiction syndrome. So I mentioned to you earlier that that I was reserving that for human beings, but in reality, the same principle is even if, is even the devil's M.O. In, in the bacterial world. And another reason why this is important is because bacteria are vitally necessary for our food sources because they're, lying, they're all around the root of the plant and they're what bring in the nitrogen and make it presentable to the plant so we can use it and in return the plant gives it complex polysaccharides to live on so it's a symbiotic relationship. If you get these uh, um, bacteria and you make them pathogenic, they're going to affect and they, and they, for instance, become noxious to plants, then guess what happens? We have crop failures. So this isn't just us not getting an infection. This is uh, endangering our entire biome because the bacteria are really at ground zero for all life forms. Again, it's just talking about plasmin-borne antibiotic resistance. We've covered that. A quick look at what works on the bacteria. This is a bacteriophage. And you notice it's got a body which is loaded with the genetic information that I've been talking about. And it's like a hypodermic needle. See the, the, the feet touch onto a and the, these are selective to which bacteria they go for. It touches onto the bacteria, and then that, what looks like to be a corkscrew, it comes and sits right down on the, on the membrane and drills a hole, and once it drills a hole in, it injects like a hyperdermic, as if someone were squeezing that bag up there, all of the stuff is emptied into the cell, and it takes over the cell. I just wanted you to see what one looked like, because um, do you think that our creator, the same creator that does the beautiful flowers and sunsets and everything else, would create something like this? Just, just looking at it. Just, just look at, just look at, just stand back and get a gestalt. Viruses are particularly easy to overlook because they are completely outside our sensory range. This is a problem because by missing the virosphere, biologists have effectively ignored the most abundant and diverse biological entities on Earth. Conservatively, there are 1 times 10 to the 31st. Okay, let me put this number in perspective for you. If you go out and look at all of the observable universe, and I'm, I'm using Hubble telescope or by uh, infrared or any other uh, means that you want to look at the universe. If you look at all of the galaxies, which originally were thought to be about 100 billion, and in 2010 they came out and says, no, it's probably not 100 billion, it's probably closer to a trillion. And they used to say that every galaxy had between 100 billion and 300 billion stars, and now they're saying, well, no, that's not true. Actually, we're finding a number of galaxies way out there that have a trillion stars in them. So if, you add a, if they added them all up, they said, well, of the observable universe, we think there are three times 10 to the 23rd stars. Three times 10 to the 23rd stars. Now look how many viruses we have on our planet conservatively. 10 times, one times 10 to the 31st. This is magnitudes higher. Are you getting an idea of the infestation? An alien visiting our planet giving a different sensory range that could detect viruses would likely consider them the dominant form of life. And I referred to this article before. If, if you were looking at our Earth just at numbers, you would think that the viruses were, were our keepers. And they would be growing us for food. 
because they have the numbers and they have the information systems to take over the world, all the living organisms in it, many times over. Our best estimates that every week 10 to 31st viruses fall apart and 10 to the 31st new ones are made to replace them. Well, I just said there's one times 10 to the 31st viruses in our biome. And that if you read this article, at first you'd say, well, every week they die off and new ones are made. Actually, some viruses are long. They, they stick around for a long time, and other viruses are here for just a couple of hours. So the ones that have a short turnover time turn over many times during that week, and you can have other viruses which can lay dormant for a while outside of a host who are still there. So it's, it's a difference in the uh, ability of the viruses to multiply. The point of these exercises is to show just how numerous, massive, and dynamic these 10 to the 31st viruses really are. When considering the virus sphere, extremely unlikely events become prob probabilistic certainties. What are they saying here is, that's why these guys can mutate very, they, there are so many times each week they remake themselves that the chance for them to mutate is overwhelming, and that's why we can't keep up with them. That's why we can't make vaccines to everyone out there, because they're changing rapidly, way too fast for us to respond. Because viruses are incredibly abundant, much more so than microbes, and because the majority of the information contained in viral genomes is unknown, viruses are the final frontier of unexplored genomic diversity and are the largest genetic repository that exists. And here's the question. We are left with the question, why are there so many viruses? Good question. Think about that for a moment. How come there's so many of them? Because in reality, there's so many of them, there's enough to really kill all of us off many times over. Why haven't they? Envisioning the biosphere as a massive system that ultimately feeds viruses helps us address a major outstanding question. Why is biological diversity dominated by viruses? This question would not have been occurred to would not have occurred to earlier biologists simply because they did not know the extent of the virus sphere. So recapping, there's three things out there in the biome. There's transposable elements, that's vertical transmission. That means a parent gives it to the daughter cells, and the daughter cells gives it to their daughter cells, so it's a vertical transmission. It can also go horizontally. Viruses are what carry genetic information from one from one uh, life form to another. And you know that's how we get avian flu and swine flu that originally started in birds and in swine. And it crosses over to us. And then plasmids can go both ways. Plasmids are ACDC. They can go vertical, they can become implanted, it become permanent part of the bacterial genome, or they can remain outside in a circle and be multiply and then transfer out to other bacteria. The uh, the uh, host bacteria makes multiple copies of it and sends them out to all its friends. And they pick it up and then they obtain the same characteristic. Okay, now we're going to look at just two things and we're done. And these I picked on purpose because they really uh, illustrate some very important principles which are found throughout this infestation. The first is yeast and alcohol. Transposable elements are associated with constitutive expression of yeast alcohol dehydrogenase number two. Well, if you read this, you go, so what? Well, it's a big so what. Because if yeast didn't have this capability, we wouldn't have any alcoholic beverages. What this is saying is, is in the yeast, for some reason, that when they are presented with glucose, instead of opening up the aerobic metabolism, and if those of you have had some biology, I'm referring to the Krebs cycle, you've heard of that? That's aerobic, you need oxygen for that cycle to work. And it is very efficient, it, get, it delivers about five to seven times the amount of uh, available energy to the cell in the form of ATP than anaerobic, which is uh, Metab uh, um, energy metabolism which is done without oxygen present. 
fermentation is another word for that, okay? You get much less energy for every molecule of glucose, you'll get way more energy if you go through the, aero, a, a, through the Krebs cycle, through the oxygen cycle, you get a lot more energy than if you take that same molecule of glucose and put it through the anaerobic cycle, you get much less. So you have to use a lot more glucose to keep the cell alive, and it has to work much more uh, by, uh, me metabolically. It has to do a lot more steps to keep itself alive because it's getting so little energy out of each glucose molecule as presented to it. Well, what happens with the yeast is something that is dictated by mobile genetic elements that when this enzyme that when plenty of energy is present, is in glucose, and there's oxygen present, it shuts off the anaerobic limb and shunts all of the um, substrate through the aerobic or the Krebs cycle, the one that you get all the, the energy from. But in yeast, it doesn't do that. Instead, it flips it. Present with oxygen, whether or not you're present with oxygen, if, you're pres if it's presented with glucose, it, it turns that yeast into an anaerobic metaboliz uh, metabolizing entity. The glucose itself changes the system, whether it's presented with oxygen or not. Now, you know, when you, for, when you distill, uh, distilleries put um, the yeast in along with, if they're going to make wine or, or beer that's with the hops or whatever, and they try to make it an anaerobic system so that it can keep the yeast producing in this manner. But all you have to do is present them with a high glucose subload, and it will make that yeast, contrary to its best interests, go into the anaerobic uh, mechanism of getting energy. Why is that important? Because the end product is alcohol. The end product is alcohol. Now, alcohol is very damaging to all cells. I know you've read all the propaganda that wine and, and uh, two glasses a day for men and one for women. Three years ago, I was going to write a paper about this because um, there is so much evidence that this is a massive public relation campaign funded and paid for by the Distillers Association. And yes, they have bought off different research scientists at three different localities, I won't name them here, uh, to pour out research indicating that this is healthful. And it's all correlative. If you understand correlative, it's not an experimental design. So all they're saying is, is this is correlated with the other. And, and the way that they can play with data is magnificent when you have correlations because you have what is called confounding variables that get in the way and you just say, well, I mathematically took care of them. And I have a stack of papers. There's over 300 from these three institutions telling you how good alcohol is. And one of the papers even says that alcohol was good to drink the night before you ran on a marathon. Come on. Anyone who's drunk alcohol knows that that's the worst thing you can drink the night before. And they had their, the statistics all jerry-rigged. Another paper which I have at home states that alcohol is actually good for women to drink to prevent breast cancer. Then they came out with a real experimental design to counteract these guys and shows it is one of the main causes of BRCA1 to liberate it and get it functioning in a woman's breast tissue and cause breast cancer. The United States has been, well, the world has been sold a bill of goods with this Mediterranean diet because if you take the alcohol, what's good about the wine is the resveratrol which comes from the grapes and you can get the same thing without the wine. So what they're saying is, oh, but you need the wine. You just need to drink some fresh grape juice every day. The alcohol is a poison and a toxin to the system, and they try to camouflage it to say it isn't. That is a lie. I have looked carefully at all of the literature, and the only literature they have that shows that it may have a good effect on the cell is bogus. It was printed in some throwaway journal that's not even peer-reviewed. Alcohol, if you talk to any biologist, is a poison to the cell. There's no such thing as taking it in small amounts and having it be efficacious. That is a lie. And everything that they give you that shows that it's good, it's always showing you between, uh, they'll say that people who drink a lot live longer than people who don't. Well, guess what? People who aren't drinking a lot in our culture are people who have very serious diseases and they're getting ready to die. See how that works? 
and I could take you down all of their arguments. Now I'm going to get off my soapbox. Let's get back to what we're talking about here. So, mobile genetic elements have come in and they have engineered yeast cells so that they are obligate anaerobic metabolizers and as a consequence they make lots of alcohol. And that alcohol can be very deadly to the yeast cell, but guess what else those mobile genetic elements conveniently bring along? Certain proteins that help damp, dampen the effect of the alcohol on the yeast cell so we can live on to make more alcohol. And uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the name for the yeast that makes, uh, that the distillers use. And I just want you to see the retro, retro transposons um, are, they have organized the genome. So what? Well, guess what alcohol does in our brains? Um, Alcohol causes dopamine to be released in the nucleus acumens. Well, actually, I'm going to, this is a little technical mumbo jumbo for someone who may be listening to this and has a rather more extensive knowledge. So I want to be absolutely accurate here. Alcohol causes the release of certain neurotransmitters in the ventral tegmental area, which leads into the nucleus accumens of the brain. The nucleus accumens of the brain is the area where we experience pleasure, no matter what, whether it's you get a compliment, you've had a good meal, um, the rewards for sex are located there, um, you name it. If you, whatever it is that makes you feel really good and rewarded, that's the center. That's where you go and you turn in your chips and you get your payout, your, your feel-good payout. Well, so alcohol causes release of, of uh, neurotransmitters in the ventral tregmental area, which increases the amount of dopamine that's released in the nucleus acumens that triggers the D2 receptors, which are what make you feel really good. But alcohol just doesn't do that. There's 11 other major transmitters uh, in the uh, uh, major areas of the brain, uh, the receptors that it triggers. So it doesn't just hit the reward system. It hits the system that lets you think clearly in your prefrontal core and frontal cortex, and it shuts those areas down. It caps off those receptors. It sits there and stops them from being triggered. And we don't have time to go what it does in your brain, but let me tell you something. It takes over. This isn't some good tonic that's there to really help things out. It makes, does two things, and this is what makes it so popular. The first thing is it is a depressant because it inhibits glutamine trans, uh, the, the glutamine messenger in the brain, which is the most common, the, most, the one that, you, that our brains de depend on. So it, it calms things down, and it increases something called the, the triggering of the gamma amino butyric acid, GABA, which is the, it, it filters out all of the background noise in your brain, and it makes you feel, ah, you know, all that nagging thing, ah, I've got to go, I've got to be sure I do this at work tomorrow. When, when you take a drink, that worry about doing that at work tomorrow just disappears away. That GABA just takes it out. All of the background stuff just gets removed. All of those back programs that are running in your brain, it shuts them off. And so the, what happens is you get all of a sudden, you're able to think very clearly. The trouble is you can't think about anything. So you're there thinking about how clearly you, you are thinking, and that's about it. And problems that seemed so big before just melt away. And of course, the conclusions you come to are absurd, but at the time, they sound pretty good. So it takes us out of the rat race. It's both a, it, 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 it takes away the nagging things of life, and it puts them into the background. But it does that at a huge price. I, I'm putting this up primarily for those out there who want to look up this paper. And I'm going to just make a, a blanket statement. The neurotransmitters in your brain are chemical that chemicals that live 
leave from come from elsewhere and they go to a neuron and they trigger that neuron. Last week we saw the opsins on those neurons on the mice, remember, with the laser. Those are receptors. And they are called G protein receptors. And the um, G protein receptors, the main family uh, is the one that I put up here. They're called the uh, rhodopsin family. Now, rhodopsin comes from what, what they first discovered it in the eyes. Remember, they have cones and rods. Cones see light, a uh, color, a rod seen light. And at night, you're using your rods, rhodopsin rods. That's where they found it. Light triggers those receptors so that they then start a, an electrical current in that rod in your retina. But they found that these proteins out on the outside of the cell that control the function of the cell, they're called, um, they're ubiquitous. They're called G-coupled proteins. And these G-coupled proteins are a way that the body communicates. Here's the bottom line. And I'll put the other three up real quick. Three major mobile genetic elements families have moved into the genes coding for these receptors. All of the G protein receptors, all the G coupled protein receptors have been hacked. They've been changed. OK, why? You say, well, so what? I'll give you a so what. In alcohol, uh, one uh, author uh, made the following um, hypothesis, which I think is correct. And what this author said is about 20% of the population has especially been hacked in the dopamine receptor. And what happens is the dopamine receptor still functions, but it only functions maybe at 50, and this is, these are my numbers, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it's like around 50%. So that when a dopamine molecule comes in and tries to settle in on that receptor, 50% of the time it can't get in there to trigger it. And 50% of the time it does. So you get half of what you were supposed to get as far as a reward in the nucleus accumens. But when you drink alcohol, the alcohol molecule is able to go in and sit in that D2 receptor and change its conformation so that it becomes more like it should have been configured in the first place, and which means that m the dopamine coming across, maybe 80% of those molecules can now get in and trigger it. And remember, that's where you get your reward. So this set of people are really set up to become addicted to alcohol, or what we call alcoholics. If you go out and you do a survey of the, pub of the population right now, about 8 to 10% are clearly identified as alcoholics. But if you look carefully and you dig under the under the surface, you'll find there's another 10% out there who should be diagnosed that, but are very adept at avoiding detection, which would match about what they're finding on this dopamine 2 receptor situation. And what these people will tell you, the ones, the addicts who say, yeah, I've got an addiction, what they'll come forth and they'll tell you is, I drink to feel normal. I don't drink every day because I want to go out and get inebriated. I have to have a few drinks to feel normal. And what I'm now interpreting, this is me talking, what, I'm, what I think is happening is they need that basis amount of alcohol just to go up there to keep those D2 receptors in a configuration where they get normal feedback that you and I take for granted. Now. Let's look at this for a moment. We have mobile genetic elements which have come in and engineered the poor Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast plant, so it has to make anaerobic metabolism and make alcohol. And then you have mobile genetic elements in the human genome which change the dopamine receptor, actually changes all the receptors. Does that look to you like someone might have engineered it? What are the chances that that would occur by chance? By the way, as far back as recorded history that we have, alcohol, uh, alcoholic beverages have been around. If you look at uh, the literature out there, they'll say six or seven thousand BC or six or seven thousand years ago in China was the first 
clearly indication, but it's, it was in Egypt. It's, it's, it was in Babylon. Remember Belteshazzar? What was he doing? He was drinking at the time. Many, many tinkle, you farson. Remember all that? It's been with us all along. 50% of sexually transmitted diseases are con contracted with either one or both parties are drunk. So if we eliminated alcohol, we would cut, cut our SD, STD uh, exposure down immensely, and I suspect it would go even further down than that. They're just saying that when it's transmitted, 50% of the, of the recipients are drunk. Um, the ramifications go beyond that. And if you find spousal abuse, alcohol is almost always involved. The list goes on. Someone doesn't have our best interests And they've been engineering our environment, our biome. They've been infesting it with these, I'm going to call landmines. Now, this slide is to tell you one thing, and that is that alcohol selectively inhibits the prefrontal and frontal cortex. That's where you have your sensor. That's where you have you say, well, I shouldn't do that. That's where you do your ethical thinking. That's where you do your higher order thinking, like mathematics. If you get someone really inebriated, ask them to solve an algebraic uh, equation for you and watch them. It's fun for a little while. It selectively shuts down. And if you drink alcohol long enough, it changes the architecture of the brain, totally changes the architecture of the brain and the way the neurons fire and the way they work. This has been a well-planned attack, in my opinion. And this is just another paper quoting just what I told you. Prefrontal cortex seems highly sensitive to the toxic effects of alcohol. Okay, we're going to the last one now, leprosy. Hansen's disease, it was discovered by, uh, uh, I think he lived in Switzerland, uh, a gentleman in the late 1800s where he was the first one to find the cause of leprosy, and it, he was the first person to find a bacteria as being the cause of disease. So it was, in, it was in leprosy. And all of us today, because we're not plagued with it, don't realize what a bane it was throughout the world for the prior history of humanity. It's been a horrible disease. True leprosy was incurable in biblical times. It spreads by droplets, so it's contagious. It's physically, it physically deforms its victims. It spreads throughout the whole body. It attacks the sheath of the nerve cells, gradually causing inflammation and then death of the nerve, primarily the sensory nerves. It isolates its victims as outcasts. It affects the optic nerve, causing visual blindness and uh, visual defects and ultimately blindness. Why do you keep on rebelling? Do you want to be punished even more, Israel? Your head is already covered with wounds and your heart and mind are sick. From head to foot, there is not a healthy spot on your body. You are covered with bruises and sores and open wounds. Your wounds have not been cleaned or bandaged. No medicine has been put on them. This is Isaiah 1, 5 to 6. Biblical scholars are in agreement. This is, was describing leprosy at the time. What, what, what God is doing here is he's made it very clear that sin that leprosy is a very good illustration of sin. God is saying, if you want to know what sin is like, look at leprosy. Here's some leprous hands. You can see the open sores, and it affects the bones and, and uh, causes inflammation of the tendons. So you can see those hands really can't work anymore. Look at what it does to the face. For some reason, it really, it really uh, often shows up in the face very early. And it causes great, gross disfigurement. This gentleman is early on in the disease. Look at this boy. I really don't have to comment on this. If it weren't for the triple antibiotics that we have nowadays, 
this boy, and it, and it affects young people. If you go in the, uh, into medieval times, it was, it was all throughout Scandinavia and throughout uh, uh, Europe, um, and it affects young people. And they get it in their bones and their spines. They're disfigured. They can't, they can't walk. Their faces are discovered. They have open sores everywhere. There's no diseases that is good, but this is one of the worst. And that's the blindness that occurs. It's disfiguring. It's horrific. Okay, why does this, why does this, uh, it's the Mycobacterium leprae, and it's a cousin, very close first cousin of Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And what they have found is that the two bacteria, though, at one time were very close to each other in their genomic makeup, and now they aren't. It says less than half of the genome of the uh, leprae uh, con contains functioning genes, but pseudo, uh, but pseudo genes with intact counterparts in M. tuberculosis. Uh, genome downsizing and the current mosaic arrangement appear to have resulted from extensive recombination events. Whenever you see that word, recombination, we're talking mobile genetic elements. That's code word clearly in any biological journal. When you use that word, you're talking about mobile genetic elements between dispersed repetitive sequences. There you go, repetitive sequences. Whenever you see that, your normal genome, by normal I mean not mobile genetically uh, altered genome, doesn't have a lot, it doesn't have repetitive sequences. Someone knew what they were doing when they wrote the code and they just wrote it down. Gene depletion and decay have eliminated many important metabolic activities. Now, siderophone Siderophore production is the protein that goes out and gets iron, and I've already covered why they need that. Part of the oxidative and most of the um, micro aerophilic and anaerobic respiratory chains. Well, big words just to tell you that you need it in order to make, with oxygen, you get much more energy from glucose or any other food substrate, and therefore you need to have iron as part of that process in order to extract that energy. And that's what these bacteria are looking for. The important thing here is that uh, I, this is just a looking look at their genome, which is in a circle. If you look at the uh, third and fourth circle in, those are the pseudogenes. Look at the numbers. They are almost the same number as the regular genetic material. Here's the, the important thing is under the pseudogenes in M, Leprae, there are 1,116. In M. tuberculosis, which is its first cousin, there are six. You remember we talked about pseudogenes the last two weeks? There are mobile genetic element altered genes, or actually genes that have been brought in by mobile genetic elements. It says many of the 136 residual coding sequences in M. leprae, which show no similarity to no genes, in other words, in the whole plant and animal kingdom, you can't find any coding sequences that match these. They've come from, well, we don't know where. Well, I think I know where, but we don't know where. They're totally new, unique, which show, um, may also represent pseudogenes as they are shorter than average and occur in regions of low gene density. So this is a genome that has been massively hacked. What has happened is the genes that are required for no, normal metabolic and cell functioning have been either uh, completely infiltrated by mobile genetic elements and rendered ineffective, or they've been shut down by mobile genetic elements by removing the promoter. The M. leprae can only live in human, has to live in, a, in another source in order to survive. It can no longer do the normal functioning day-to-day -day living. It has to live in a, sor in, a, in a host which provides that for them. And you can't culture this bacterium in a petri dish. It is that, um, it has been so heavily, uh, the information system has been so heavily hacked that it can't even live on its own in a petri dish if you supply it with all the nutrients that it needs. It can't function. It needs your cells to make, and, and, and as if to chop up the food, 
put it in a blender and then feed it the pablum. It can't take food any other way. It needs a host to come and prepare the, the energy for it in a way that it can take and use. And armadillos are the only thing you can culture this bacteria in besides us. It's very specific. Strikingly, M. leprae contains the highest number of pseudogenes among published genomes. In other words, anywhere that we look in a plant or animal kingdom, the number one organism with the most pseudogenes is this bacterium. And it's small. It doesn't have near the genome you and I do. It has been massively hacked. And although the roles of RNA derived from pseudogene and non-coding genomic regions remain unknown in MR leprae, some of the pseudogene expression has been reported in cancer and central nervous system in other species and disease states in other species. So the protein that's transcribed from some of these novel coded areas in M. leprae are also found in, place in other disease entities not in this bacterium, principally in multicellular organisms us that match up with cancer. So whoever thought up of this disease is also probably the res responsible for cancer. And we went through cancer pretty well last week. And it's mobile genetic elements again, of course. Okay, how do they do this? Now, this just stay with me. We're almost done. And this is fascinating. So if you're going to wake up for any part of the lecture, now's the time. You've heard a lot about stem cells, right? And the idea is what they want to do is they want to take, uh, like if, if I decided I wanted to make a clone of myself, I know you're all thinking, heaven forbid, please no. Uh, I will just use this illustration uh, theoretically, of course. I, if they could take a buccal mucosa from me and they could make another Robert Meloshenko from that. because. All the genetic information is there. Remember they did it to, uh, what's her name, the, the uh, sheep? Yes. They did it to her. She didn't live very long, and there's reasons why, and we'll be covering that, I think it's next week, why that cloning doesn't work. It has something very important to do with salvation, believe it or not. Um, what these bacteria can do and why they're being studied so carefully is they can go into the Schwann cell, that's the myelin, the, the cell that goes around the nerves and nu gives it nutrient and keeps the nerves firing at a rapid rate. And it reprograms the Schwann cell back to a stem cell. Now a Schwann cell is a cell that's been differentiated and it is, its function is to do one thing and that's to be a Schwann cell. But they can actually change that swan cell back to a stem cell, which means a stem cell is like it's been undifferentiated. It can become a number of different cells, different kinds. It's, it's, a, it's like a tabla rosa. It's like the whiteboard right here. We erased it. The, uh, lots of instructions on this whiteboard. It's now white. Someone can come and write some new instructions. Well, we're talking about this genetically. And this is big. Because if we could find out, if scientists could find out how to take a normal cell and switch it back to a stem cell, you can see they could then say, okay, you don't have any kidneys. We're going to make you a new kidney. Because we'll make this stem cell differentiate into kidney cells. And we'll grow you a kidney. So this is big. So that's why science is really looking at this. Well, somehow this M. leprae has devised or has been given the ability to change a swan cell back to a stem cell and that stem cell then leaves the nerve and goes out into the parenchyma and it goes into the bone and it becomes a bone. It, it delivers, it carries with us the M. leprae and it delivers the, the M. leprae to the bone cells. And it comes in a stem cell so the bones think, hey, this is okay. Come on in. We have stem cells here. You, every organ of your body has stem cells. Remember we talked about that? There's nothing to worry about. You want to talk about a Trojan horse? It's filled with these guys, and they come out and infect the bone. Or they come out and they infect the tissue. Or they come out and they infect the eye. They come out. It takes them all throughout the body. And actually the white blood cells will pick it up and give it a ride. 
because they think, oh, we need to move these, these guys around. It takes incredible engineering to that. We don't even understand how they do that. To be able to take a regular cell and send it back to a stem cell, that is big. Somebody has to know what they're doing. And this bacteria is not that smart. There are two aspects that make this study particularly exciting. Well, scientists are excited about this. You can understand why. We're, they're not talking about disfiguring people. They're talking about finding a way to take and move cells back to a stem from a, from a differentiated to a back to a stem cell. There are two uh, aspects that make this study particularly exciting. First, it shows that pathogen, a pathogen is capable of exploiting the genomic plasticity, that's going back to a stem cell, of a highly specialized differentiated cell by erasing its identity and reprogramming it. Folks, that's what sin has done to you and me. It's erased our identity as children of God and it has reprogrammed us just like this M. leprae does to its host. Excellent, perfect analogy. It's not even analogy. It's, it's the M.O. This is how sin works. We're now looking at it. God, when he was talking in Isaiah and other places in the Old Testament, was referring to this. He says, you want to know what sin's like? Here it is. This is what it does. Here is on exhibit perfectly the way the devil operates. This is his kingdom. This is the way he does things. This is what he's doing to you. Do you want to cooperate with him? You think this is a good idea? Then why do we? And it happened, as he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy. And seeing Jesus, he fell on his face, and he begged him. He says, Lord, if you will, you can cleanse me. And stretching out the hand, he, he touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately, the leprosy departed from him. Last slide. Do you see why God has to make everything new? There's no part of this planet that hasn't been absolutely infested. He's got no choice. Everything has been hijacked, irreparably hijacked. And that includes he's got to make you and me new if we're going to fit in this new world. Okay, next week, we talk about what happened in the garden. It's not, uh, it's not what's been built in the past, at least what you're going to hear here isn't what, what's been built in the past. Hopefully, this uh, appears to have been recorded, so it will be uploaded. And uh, as I re so those of you who came in late, I give, given Dr. Small, there is a YouTube where the first two have been placed on YouTube. There's the call letters to get there. Last week, as you know, we had a difficulty with the um, picking up the audio portion. And so that we're, we're working to correct that. When it is corrected, it will be placed on YouTube also. And this will appear next week. Obviously, I'm referring a lot to past lectures. And in the future, I'm going to be referring to past lectures even more. So. If you want to stay abreast with what's happening, I would highly encourage that you just look at them and, and get where we're going. Um, OK, with that, is there any questions? Or have I sufficiently confused you? It appears I've sufficiently confused you. Yes? I 
have about 200 papers at my house. It's not in any one paper. It's laborious, and you have to be very good at reading scientific literature. I wish that there was a good synopsis out there, but there, it, there isn't. I'll tell you this. I was, I, I, I'm sorry, I guess I should tell for the people who are on listening on uh, the internet that the question is, where is the source for um, what I was talking about alcohol as far as it being, um, uh, you know, brought in as a health agent. It's actually labeled as this may be healthful for you. They actually got the government, the FDA, to put that, allow them to put that on the labels. How did that happen? And how, how do we get to the bottom of what alcohol does? Well, the answer is that there is multiple papers out there. And I had the grandiose idea I was going to write one. And when I started going around and talking to some of my scientific friends, they said, don't waste your time. No one's interested. Everyone wants to drink it. If they want to drink it, they're not going to read your article. And if they're not drinking it and they read your article, they're not going to drink it anyway. You're wasting your time. And I saw it and I thought about it. And I said, you know, that's right. Because if you want to drink it, it doesn't matter what evidence is presented to you. You saw this on the label. It says maybe help, maybe one of the uh, ingredients of a healthful diet, and you're going to run with it. That's all the permission you need. Um, there is a uh, there's a very good source in San Francisco. I don't know if they're still functioning. They were three years ago, where it's a nonprofit that's trying to get out the the word on. Uh, what alcohol really does, and it's primarily funded and supported by people who are either were alcoholics or are family members of alcoholics. So um, I I can try to get that, see if they're and give turn get get you to them. They can give you some resource materials, but it's it takes a lot of painstaking digging. Any other questions? Okay, let's have a quick word of prayer. We're done. Father, we think we are very thankful for what you have obviously done to keep us afloat as a human race and keep our world still functioning. A gargantuan task, to say the least. Truly, you do make the sun to rise on the good and the evil alike to even keep this program going. Be with us this week and help us to cooperate with you in this great um, wonderful endeavor to remake everything new, which actually starts now with us and will end up in the new, in the new earth. In thy name, amen.